So I'd like to talk more about your career, especially your early career or going into your career, starting your career. Um, somewhere, I think it was on, the, on your biography for the University of Southampton, you said there was a line which said um, when you were starting your career in conducting, you forged your own path. And I, when I read this, I really, really resonated because that's what I feel like I'm doing now. I feel like my path into sort of the world of maybe music and journalism isn't the traditional and conventional path. And it seems like everything I do seems a bit uh, off the cusp, against the stream, against the stream. And, mm. um, and I just wanted the, your opinion and your experience and wisdom from when you were younger and forging your own path. What was that like for you? I think as you ask this question, <clears throat> Excuse me. As you were asking that question, Anthony, I, I had a few inner, well, a few thoughts about what I might say and whether saying X or Y might either embarrass myself or show me to be in not quite a, such a glowing, glamorous light. And I then thought to myself, oh, screw that. Pardon my French. Um, I... I'm old enough and wise enough to not care so much about those things. So I think I'll answer the question by being really quite uh, honest. I think if you'd asked me that question 30 years ago, I'd have a very different answer. But I guess the same would be the case for any questions you ask of anybody. One's experience is going to change. Um, I'll say a few things. I, I think that people who... I actually don't remember where I've written that. Um, it could be, it's probably in the, in, in, in the little piece that I wrote on my biog for University of Southampton uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a coach and mentor teacher, um, rather than my official biography, wh where that kind of thing would be unlikely to crop up. And I, but anyway, I think the danger with people who say that they have forged their own career is that many people are potentially going to look at that and go, oh, well, they weren't good enough to do dot, dot, dot. Because that certainly isn't the logical implication, but people who read things and make judgments seldom follow logic. And our world, the musical world, is, and certainly was when I was starting out 20, 30 years ago, certainly was very, uh, well, an incredibly judgmental world. If you haven't been to College X or University Y and studied with world-class guru Z, then it's not going to happen for you, buddy. Um, no matter how well you sit down and play the Chopin, because actually we won't listen to you playing the Chopin because you haven't been to Music College X or University Y and studied with world-class pedagogue Z. Um, and I think that world of gatekeepers and uh, some kind of snobbery has changed quite a bit over the last couple of decades in, in the time that I have been uh, working as a professional musician. I've seen things change quite radically about time. Thankfully, I do think that there is this kind of invisible but ever-present kind of uh, almost, it's, it's almost like an addiction for some people, whether they are lay people or people in the music profession, to, to, to find out something about an, an artist and go, oh, they don't fit that category. They haven't followed this map this path or they haven't done this and they haven't jumped that hurdle or passed through this you know staging post and I think people and you're <laughs> telling me that I'm one of them very much who who say that they've forged their own path are quite possibly in that camp I didn't go to music college it's taken me a number of years to 
I think, get over what was a totally pointless and uh, a totally pointless inner ba barrier in my head that somehow I felt like, because I did go to music college because I studied the violin there, but I'm talking about as a conductor, right? Yeah. I didn't go to music college. I tried, I didn't get in. Now it's taken me, and, and again, I feel like I should be here with my, 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 my couch and paying you a therapist's <laughs> fee. But actually, I think there's really something quite important here. And actually of all the things that I've ranted on about today, I wonder if this could be one of the most important things both for me to get out into the open, not because it kind of self-serving purpose, because I want to tell the world, nothing to do with that, but because there's going to be some people out there who are likely to listen to this and go, actually, I find myself in that situation currently. And that's really quite reassuring that this guy has worked his way around it on whatever. Uh, and, and so, so I kind of say this I think ho hopefully to give people a little bit of motivation that forging your own path is okay. You've just got to keep your eyes open and your wits about you and be very self-aware and incredibly prudent. Now, I think that I... So I, I think that I was a little bit in denial for a long time about what was going on in my head. Oh, you didn't go to music college, Robin. You didn't go to music college. You went to university, and then you went to another university, and you studied there as well. And you studied there, and you did study actually with this world-class, world-leading guru. Actually, that's one box to, but you don't feel ready, and you don't feel worthy because dot, dot, dot. And I think I carried that, and I don't mind saying this now. I can openly say this now. Even probably five years ago, if, if you know, I wouldn't have dreamt of opening up about this. But now, I couldn't give a damn. And I kind of want the world to know, not because I want to make some big song and dance about my own, you know, um, inner demons. No, but because I want the world to know how difficult the musical world is and how really difficult every individual finds it to cross over this boundary here or get over that hurdle there or get that door to open somehow or to choose a different door to get open because I think my struggle was that I pushed my way forwards through just grim sheer determination it would have been so easy for me to stop you know I didn't get into that competition or I didn't get into that master class I got another another knockback and all the rest of it now Find me a classical musician, a professional musician, classical musician, who's not had, like, an armful of rejection letters. You know, there won't be one. It's, 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 it's part and parcel of the territory. So I'm not sitting here to say, oh, but my story is so sad, Anthony, and I, the fact I've made it this far, you know. No, I'm not saying it for that reason at all. I'm saying it because even when you talk to your friends and your colleagues, it can't not help but feel a little bit personal. You start to think, oh, another rejection letter. Oh, Tanglewood didn't want to, whatever, dot, dot, dot. And you kind of end up carrying this burden, while all the time there's this other burden saying, I didn't play the game, I didn't follow the path as it is mapped out for every other musician. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, and I didn't win that. Oh, well, that's it, I should give up then. But I didn't give up. I kept going, and another, and I would, and yes, not everything I applied for ended up with a rejection letter. I did get there, and I did get that job, and I did get that audition, and I may not have gone very far, or I did get into that competition, and I may not have won, but I made it to the semi-final, and you kind of end up with these things, and so like so many musicians, you end up with, you know, uh, a couple of didn't qualify, no gold medals, but actually, this is really not a bad result. It might not be a gold medal, but you, you, you end up with a clutch of, well, what can I do with this? What can I do with this? And this is the path that almost all artists go on. The problem is, is that when I was going on that path, I didn't realise that. And I did not have the perspective that I now have. To be able to look back at the early stages of my training and certainly the early stages of my career and be able to reassure myself and say hey buddy this is hard don't give up 
this will make sense. It probably will take a few years, right? And someday you will be able to look at yourself and go, well, actually, I may not be here, but I'm quite happy here. Or I feel uh, successful. I feel able to express myself musically, artistically here, et cetera, et cetera. And forging your own path, I think, does have, it does have that odor of, well, they didn't get in there. Oh, yeah. And that is such a toxic way of thinking. And I can, I certainly am not going to sit here and list you names of people who've at least hinted that, that they think in that way. But I've encountered them in my musical career journey. I'm sure you've encountered them on yours, even though you're far younger than I am. I'm sure everybody who's had the privilege of sitting at this piano, including students here and Radu Lupu and John Lil, right, have had similar things. Perhaps they haven't let it get to them, or perhaps they have and we just don't know about it. Not everybody who auditions for the Royal Academy of Music is going to get in there, but that doesn't mean that people who don't get in there no longer have some musical artistic validity in what they want to say. And I think my journey was that I tried this, and I think so much of the artist's journey is knocking on doors. So much of it is knocking on doors, even hammering on doors, and keeping going back to the same door and hoping it will open. But I think if I had my 20s and 30s again, I would have chosen to knock on different doors. And I would have chosen to change the door that I kept knocking on sooner than I did. And I would have, of course, I'm talking metaphorically. And I think, and now I can sit here with my life experience and musical experience and career experience and say, I do not give two hoots about the path that I followed. I do not care that the path I have followed has been forging my own path. And so somebody who comes to me who is, uh, I don't know, a conductor or a soloist or a composer, I, yes, I read their biography with interest because I'm fascinating. Oh, you've conducted the Low Sound Festival Orchestra. Good for you. Or you've made recordings, whatever. But, you know, either they have something artistic to say or, or they don't. And they have a vehicle through which to say it, i.e. a technique, or they don't. Um... They have a personality to get it across to the audience or to the orchestra or both, or they don't. And I, I am so grateful that finally the, the gatekeepers and the people on the other side of those doors, that things have changed so much over the last few years. It's still difficult to get into um, various places, as of course it should be. Rigor needs to be upheld incredibly uh, fastidiously. Otherwise, you know, standards plummet. Um, there are some, there are better conductors coming out of music college now than ever. More of them. Thankfully, some people who aren't blokes, finally, at long last. Oh, women can conduct. Who would have thought? And, and there are some fascinating conductors c coming out who aren't just gifted with a really good pair of arms, who really can conduct incredibly well, with a really great technique, but who actually might have something artistic to say, who could hold an orchestra's attention, who can hold an audience's attention, who look good and sound good. There are, that, that, it is really, really happening. Um, and that pleases me. Now, those people would very possibly have forged some path no matter what, no matter what doors were closed and what doors opened. But I think that when I took, well, forging your own path, I think it goes back to this thing I was saying earlier on about being a lifelong learner. You know, and I think I've always wanted to, I never gave up, Anthony. I still don't give up now. The last 18 months of isolation, for want of a better word, musical creative isolation, rather than making me kind of go mute and hide in my shell and kind of go, oh, go away, world, 
I don't want to go near you, you know. I don't even want to get in the car, let alone get in front of an orchestra. Rather than do that, it's kind of made me think, right, right, where can I go now? What, what can I do now? What can I say now? How can I, how can I take other people on my journey now? Where can we go now? Uh, and, you know, as I say, I, I never gave up. It would be so easy to give up. It would be so easy to kind of go, ah, oh, you know. And whatever, I think, like I said when you, were, you and I were talking about contemporary composition and, you know, it all being noise, or a lot of it's noise, you know, about how things haven't changed because deep, core, key elements and values are still the same as they were 250 years ago, 350 years ago. They are. Um, harmonies have changed, colours have changed, but, you, you know, uh, form and structure hasn't changed so much. I, I think the same thing applies to us as artists. There is still, it, it's still difficult to get into Tanglewood, I assume, I haven't tried for a number of years. It's still difficult to get into the Royal Academy of Music, I assume. I haven't tried for a number of years. Um, it's now got, you know, probably the world's greatest conducting teacher, I think, at the Royal Academy, Sean Edwards, who I regard as a friend and uh, has helped me a great deal, actually. I just talk about forging your own path. I decided, you know, it was a while ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, to go and study with her because I'd had enough of uh, banging my head against my own technical wall. And I went to see her um, and uh, I, I said, uh, I invited her to rip me to shreds. I said, Sean, I'm doing this wrong, I'm doing this wrong. And I watched that video and it made me break out a vodka bottle, you know, uh, just, just rip me to shreds. And she went in her typically Sean Edwards way. Okay, Robin, I'll, I'll try and be kind. No, don't be kind, Sean absolutely annihilate me <laughs> and she did and I studied with her and I went to see her at her home and we studied some scores together and I prepared some things and la 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 and and I kind of reinvented myself I had enough of conducting like a klutz or whatever you would say um and yeah but it's still difficult to get into the Royal Academy of course it is it's still difficult to get wherever people want to go I think, having said all that, there are still many, many things that you just can't learn from a YouTube video. Of course. Um, you can learn some basic things. But I think it's... I, I think the key component to... One of the key things about the path that I've gone on, for whatever reasons, that door's closed, so I'm going to have to try another one, is because I've researched like anybody can. It's easier to research than ever now. You know, there's something called the internet. When I was growing up in rural Yorkshire, I had to write letters using a typewriter. Um, and I did, actually. I sent a load of letters to America, to Yale and, I don't know, Utah and USC. And I got quite a few back from various American professors saying, well, Robin, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I, I never, nothing happened. I didn't go out to America to study conducting. But that was my way of doing some research, was in the careers library of a local college, finding some addresses and writing probably hideously out-of-date addresses and sending off letters. Nowadays, you know, you can do it on your phone while you make your coffee in the morning. Uh, and it's, you know, ping somebody a, a, a quick, you know, Instagram message and you've got an online lesson set up within half an hour sometimes. You've got to do the research. But the, the danger with that is that everybody becomes a guru. Everybody becomes a blah, blah, blah. you just got to use your... And, and the same with global politics. you just got to... You've got to figure out your filters. Because if... I mean, I think, you know, I haven't looked recently on musical chairs, but, you know, last time I checked, the list of world conducting courses was getting longer and longer and longer and longer. And there's probably 20 or 30 on there. Now, you're not telling me they're all good quality courses. Some will be. Some will be great. Some will be wonderful, but a lot aren't. 
A lot are going to take three, four thousand euros from you for probably an hour of podium time throughout a week, not including your flight and include and you know, and the, and the tuition may well be questionable. So if you can afford your path, make absolutely clear what your path is and who you're going to. And there are lots of who's out there. But there are plenty of charlatans, clowns, cowboys, drama kings and queens, muppets, morons, and that's just in the conducting world. Heaven knows what it's like in the pianistic world or if you're a singer or a composer. You know, I was lucky enough to go to Siena and spend time with Ilya Musin. Um, and Valery, Valery Gergiev popped in, uh, didn't teach us, bought us all dinner as an apology, which was uh, quite a nice exchange, I thought. Uh, and Myung Wung Chung was there. Now that happened just after I spent a year doing postgrad. Um, I learned an awful lot. I mean, I learned more that summer than, than I'd learned in my life, I think. It was absolutely brilliant. But I didn't necessarily leave being that much a better conductor. I then carried on. I carried on thinking, well, this still isn't right. Let's fix it. This still isn't right. Let's fix it. You figure it out. You figure it out. But you've got to be brave. And you've got to deflect all the, sorry, the bullshit merchants who say to you, you need to follow this path and go to music college. That's the only way you're going to get there. No, it isn't. No, it is not. Music colleges are great, most of them. But it might not be great for you. Or, or that one might not be great for that person right now. Go a different path. But do your research and do your research well using really wise, open wide filters. Otherwise, you'll end up learning from a cowboy and you'll end up, end up kind of getting nowhere. Not following the, the mainstream sort of career path requires some form of sensitivity, right, to your atmosphere and your, your inner self, your inner world, and how you react to your atmosphere. Yeah, I think so. I think it does, and I think, of course, most of us become musicians because we have a degree of sensitivity that perhaps non-artists and non-musicians might not have or embrace, certainly, so readily. I mean... Artists are notoriously sensitive. Going back to my early career, early stage career path, and you know those doors and the gatekeepers and the knockbacks, which I want to repeat, I am in no way um, saying I am the only person who experienced that. As I say, the vast majority of successful musicians will have had to embrace somehow knockback upon knockback. But I think what I realized on the late side was it's not a matter of how many knockbacks you get because you're going to get them. You are going to get them time and time and time again. You're going to get them when you least expect them after you walk off stage or after an audition where you think, I perform brilliantly. And that's when it's going to hurt the most. That's when you're going to be on the plane back home thinking, I, I could have done no better and I still didn't get in. That's when it's going to really hurt. Because when you screw up and you think, well, yeah, I didn't really prepare. Oh, yeah, I, I should have learned that better. Or when you're in some world of, I don't know, self-sabotaging because you're going, well, I didn't, well, I didn't get in because I didn't prepare. Hmm. Yeah? How many of us live in that world? You know, it's certainly part of my pie chart. Hopefully, I like to think quite a small part of my pie chart, but it's there. Find me a musician where that doesn't exist. They're quite rare. And yeah probably a lot more successful because <laughs> their balance is different. But, you know, it's how you react often. And part of my experience when I was a younger musician, taking those first steps on the career path, was how, you, how sensitive I was, to use that word. It's not just sensitivity and awareness because it's great to be sensitive and to be very self-aware. But if you're too thin-skinned, either to the inevitable knockbacks or to other people's comments, because that doesn't change. That's one of many things that's not changed, despite the internet and despite social media. I mean, it's, it's a more visible, you know, judgmental world than ever. All you've got to do is, I don't know, 
so you'll put this on YouTube, and and, and the, the, I, 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 you know, bring it on, frankly. But there'll be some comments. Oh God, he goes on a bit, doesn't he? Or blah blah blah. You know, people can feel people can write anything about anybody, and they often do. Welcome to Twitter. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's a it can be a cesspit sometimes. Twitter. Yeah, it's partly why I avoided it for the last eighteen months. It's been very good for my mental health, and I go back to Twitter. Uh, cautiously, should we say. But all those comments, it doesn't matter often if the comment comes from a professor at where, you know, Conservatoire X or it comes from Joe the taxi driver in, I don't know, Lincoln. They can still be hurtful. They can still make you wonder why you do what you do. They can still be upsetting. Or you, or, or, or not. But I think... If you're beginning your career, your, your thin skin it, it's, is something you have to handle. It is something you have to deal with. And it took me a while to deal with it. Uh, and I think that's what held me back in my early career. I was allowing you know, the, the slings and arrows to deflect me from my path. And if I had my life again, I wished I would have just kind of worn some armour, metaphorically, and gone, well, that, you, great, thank you for your feedback and your comments, you moron. Thank you. I'm going to go this way anyway. All right? I, I, rather than what I tended to do, which was go, oh, God, maybe they've got a point. Mm. Maybe I was doing it too slow, or... Maybe my tuning was all over the place, or maybe maybe I should give up. Yeah, maybe I should give up. Go and get a proper job. I never listened to those inner voices enough, thankfully. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here with you today. But I did listen to them, and we all have them. And I, as I say, if I could give any advice to younger musicians listening, it's to... Hear and acknowledge those voices. Don't try and push them away because that is, you know, years of therapy if you want to get in, and which is very expensive and all the rest of it. Hear and acknowledge those voices. There may be something important in them. I don't mean the, the external people, I mean your voices. But don't let them change your path as long as you know what your path is. Don't let them deflect you. Don't give up. Don't stop. Bearing in mind that, I can't remember what the statistic is, but a transatlantic plane flying, obviously, I don't know, JFK to Heathrow, spends 99.9% .9 of its time off course. It might not be 99.9, .9, but you get the idea. It spends the vast, vast, vast majority of its time off course. And just by minute course corrections, it gets exactly where it's supposed to go. Well, hopefully, it gets exactly where it's supposed to go. Having spent so much of its time, you know, being 0.1 degree too far to the southeast. And so it is with us as musicians. Even if you follow some, you know, mapped out career path, go to university, go to music college, win a competition, boom. Right? Yeah. There's going to be minute course corrections and you're going to have to spend some time wrestling with yourself going, was that the right thing for me? Am I doing the right thing now? Was I right to, to, to spend £25,000 of my own money recording a, a, this obscure piece of Bazzoni? I don't know. Only you can tell. And self-release it. You know, <laughs> lose my mortgage. Whatever. But, you know, listen to what your 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 inner critic is saying but don't listen to it too closely because you can't shield yourself from it but you can choose to not be deflected but given the fact that you know you should slightly course correct if this isn't working for you change if you want to be a pianist and your specialism is um busoni then okay fine or ligety then okay fine it, you, you might uh, be able to carve more of a niche for yourself than if your specialism is Chopin. I don't know. You know, if you're a conductor, um, uh, y 
you, you, you might have other niche. I mean, look at somebody like, I don't know, John Wilson, who's a fabulous musician, fabulous conductor, and genuinely committed to what he kind of started doing 15 years ago. Uh, musicals and all the rest of it. Finding a niche that really works brilliantly for him. And, I mean, these are little tiny course corrections. If, 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 if you're a fabulous musician, yet conducting Beethoven is not your forte, then don't. Find something else. Avoid it. Program carefully. Grasp that nettle when you feel good and ready. Um, we have a lot more control over things than we think we do. Certainly in today's day and age, without huge impresarios telling us what to do and when and how high to jump. We can plan and map our own performances far more than we ever you know, were able to. Choose things that work for you. This goes back to what you were saying earlier on about programming. There's no, there's no point in you trying to forge a career as a pianist who specialises... Me, he's trying to forge a career as a conductor who specialises in Stravinsky and modern music when it's just not something that I'm born to do. Um, there are tons of conductors who do it far better than I am, who I do, than I do. Um, let them do it. There are other things that I can do well. I like to think. Sibelius, Elgar, Bruckner, Mahler, probably not Beethoven. One day when I'm in my 80s, I might get there with Beethoven. But, but you know, but Stravinsky, wonderful composer, let, let them do it. There's no shortage of conductors burning to conduct Stravinsky, as I've said. So I guess, yeah, uh, pick your battles that works for you. And whether it's as a musician or an artist or a journalist, you know, you know pick your subjects, pick your topics, pick your, you know. I heard somewhere that life is like a big game of chess, big long game of chess. And it wasn't until I graduated that I realized this was true, I think, from my perspective. Because, you know, if you don't follow a conventional career path and you're sort of diverted from the mainstream, it's you're sort of planning moves ahead and you're being sensitive to those moves ahead. And if you make a bad move, you do a course correction. Do you think life is like a game of chess for you as well? When you are, if you can remember, reflecting back on the start of your career... Did you have this sort of futuristic mindset? You're planning things ahead, or were you quite um, someone who was in the present, picking picking your battles in the present rather than planning your battles ahead? So a bit more hand to mouth, as it were. I think a bit of both, but mainly I was back then. I was planning ahead. Now <laughs> I don't want to sit here and appear like I couldn't care less, but I think my attitudes have changed quite a lot not least as a result of the last 18 months of lockdown, which has bizarrely refreshed and rejuvenated me as an artist, without any doubt, um, ironically. It's also shown me that I think in the past, I've kind of tried too hard in the past. I've kind of try to conduct anything that moved when I was a younger man. Just because, of course, conductors don't have an instrument um, on which they can experiment. I think the Americans call it that rather questionable uh, um, moniker, the, the laboratory orchestra, which just sounds all wrong to me, but anyway. Um, but conductors don't have that, so they've got to kind of conduct anything that moves. And I think... For a lot of my 20s into my 30s, that's what I was thinking. Ah, there's a chance to conduct some piece I've never heard of, that I have no affinity with, that I don't know how it'll be, with an orchestra I've never come across that's probably pretty not great. I'll do it. Oh, there's no fee. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I, I, need, I, need, I need the experience. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Gosh. And then that becomes a kind of learned behavior. Yeah. You end up doing it again. Or worse still, you get a reputation for doing it again. Oh yeah, pick them. They'll do it for free. They're not bad. They're not great either. They'll do it for free. Yeah. And then you end up getting trapped in this zone where you don't really move anywhere. 
you're just kind of doing things to kind of slap it into the portfolio and gain experience. So uh, you've got to be strategic. I like. I think at the time I thought I was being strategic. I don't think I was anything like strategic enough. And this goes back to musicians and artists needing to be businesslike. And I mean businesslike as in, you know, not wearing a tie and carrying an attaché case. I mean business, businesslike as in, you know, thinking entrepreneurially. Thinking like a Gary Vaynerchuk and an Elon Musk and not thinking like a John Lill and a Carlos Kleiber. Much as I adore both of those musicians, hugely. Um, you, you know, I mean, thinking uh, entrepreneurially, in other words, being strategic and thinking about, and yes, playing the game of chess, planning ahead. So what I thought in my 20s and my 30s was, okay, I didn't go here, that door didn't open, that one I'm still knocking on, one day I'll give up, one day I'll learn, that one might open, I am going to learn this from this person, learn this from this person, and then I'm going to apply for as many competitions as I can, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do the other. That didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, I've still got that, let's stop a second, let's reinvent this, let's course correct, let's do it all again. Let's do it all again. And now I'm not saying that that's either right or wrong, but as with the course correction on the transatlantic flight thing or the Elon Musk thing, any business entrepreneur will say to you, gosh, you know, you've got to fail. You've got to fail. You've got to fail 999 times before that one product comes along. Now that way of thinking, let alone talking, wasn't terribly well known in the business world 15, 20 years ago. To musicians, to go and say to a musician, you've got to fail. Anthony, you've got to play like shit. <laughs> you've got to really play badly. And then you'll be getting somewhere. Now, can you imagine that, you know, having that conversation with anyone, let alone your teacher, mentor, or yourself? Yeah. Now, oh, yeah, Robin, I, yeah, I've really, really started conducting badly. Isn't it great? No, <laughs> I don't mean that, but you've got to fail. You've got to keep going for things and ideally not be as thin-skinned as I was as a younger man. And you've got to pick yourself up, you know. Success involves picking yourself up one more time than you've been knocked down. I mean, that's such a cheesy, you know, feel-good Instagram quote, but it's so true. If you're still standing, you're, you're not knocked out of the race, you know, to be hideously mixing my metaphors, yeah? But, you know, I do think that music and the arts could learn an awful lot from the business world. I think massively, and it's something that I've explored an enormous amount over the last five or six years. I haven't gone and done an MBA. I've thought about it. I haven't gone and done one. But, but, but you know, when I jumped into a new, started wearing a new set of clothes, if you like, when I started Son Orchestra, I, I, I had to totally reinvent myself pretty quickly. It's like the... I forget another one of these entrepreneurs' comments about, you know, what starting a business is like, jumping out of a plane and learning how to make a parachute on the way down. That's kind of what it felt like. I created Son because I felt the need, I saw the reason, and I, I, I felt like I knew enough players, I had enough skill, I had enough people around me, I was in a place to be that horrible pair of words, a really good, solid, creative entrepreneur, yeah? What I lacked was any real business planning skills, any financial management, like business financial management skills, um, any marketing skills, but I learned. So in the five years that I've run Son, almost all of my development has been in the artist, uh, arts management world, in the arts leadership world. I don't regard and never will regard myself as an arts leader. I don't want to be an arts leader. I want to be a leader. I already think I am a leader of sorts, but I don't want to be an arts leader. I'm an artist. But I had to reinvent myself. I had to make multiple mini course corrections, starting going to meetings, starting doing all this. I, in, in, that, in the last five years, I've taught myself pretty much all of the main Adobe things, because I've had to. And I've taught myself WordPress, because I had to, basic coding. Uh, you know, it's not like I spend ages and ages poring over Max Richter scores. 
I mean, I wish I had, but I am. I spent half my, more than half my time at a computer going, why, why is that font not displaying properly? When you become an entrepreneur, when you become a creative entrepreneur, yeah, you, you wear so many hats, it's untrue. As musicians, we're so tunneled, you know, I'm a pianist, that's all I do. You know, it's point one not 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 one percent of the world's skill sets, or a conductor. You know, a bit more of a multitasker. But yeah, great. It's point not 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 one percent. They shouldn't become a. You you run an arts organisation, and you're dealing with the arts council or the charities commission or local councils or concert hall managers, concert halls, you're suddenly wearing so many hats that you need a new wardrobe to fit them all in. You're the marketer, you're the publicity officer, you're the librarian, you're the orchestra manager, you book people, you talk to the bank manager, all the rest of it. That's part and parcel of doing the job. Um, But, you know, I still regard that as a little course correction. I'm just learning stuff that I had to learn. You and and as a as as part of the process of doing that for five or so years, I really immerse myself in all this entrepreneurial ship stuff, and you know learning about. I mean, I had a business mentor, um, an amazing Scottish woman from up in the northwest called Ruby from um, um, no Isla Wilson. That's it from Ruby Star. Quick name check. She's an amazing, amazing business consultant. Uh, I did an arts council thing and uh, uh, she was kind of gifted to me as part of that. And it's, I mean, she specializes in many things, including uh, being a business mentor to the arts world. And it's amazing the wake up call you get. Just like all of the arts world a year ago going tax, how do I, or Zoom, Right, suddenly you talk to a real business mentor about business stuff and they go, right, well, how, wh- wh- what's your balance sheet? Where's your budget? And all the rest of you kind of go... <laughs> and you say, so when is it going to go live? And you go... <laughs> You're suddenly held accountable for stuff that's so far out of your comfort zone, whereas in the past you're just going, if I put a fourth finger on the C then I can't do that with a fourth finger. I don't, I'm no pianist, right? But if I, you know... If I do this in four, I can, that's fine. Then I slow down and then bang, that works, great. I'm accountable to the orchestra, to me, that's it. You've got a business guru in down your neck kind of going, wow. Yeah, um, but you learn so much. You learn so much about, the, the, and, and also that failing is not just important, but crucial. We don't fail as musicians. We never fail. We're taught from the age of like six or seven or eight, let alone when you get to music college, that you are not going to fail. You're going to practice 12 hours a day for three months so as you cannot fail. And, and particularly as classical musicians, particularly as classical musicians, do you think a jazz musician thinks about failing? Oh, I, oh God, I comped using the wrong inversion of that, you know, Locrian added ninth chord, that's it, my career's over, that sax dude is never going to work with me again. Can you imagine that happening? No. Or, a, or, a, or, or, I don't know, somebody in Coldplay thinking, oh, no, 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 I've got the wrong word in there. I mean, what is our industry like, Anthony? It's so perfectionist, because it has to be, because if it isn't, then, well, that's a whole other podcast. But, but, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Because we... There's another little thing I'll say, and then I'll stop ranting. Um, so in, in the course of my you know, years of running Son, I bumped into um, somebody who works at The Point at Eastleigh, who shared um, a fact that they were having... Um, that's it, Zoe Logic, a uh, dance theatre, who's now based down in the centre of Southampton, but I think back then was up at the point at Eastleigh, was doing a, um, uh, I forget what they call it, uh, was doing like a kind of a sharing thing, where they were doing an early stage performance of what was going to be later at their show, so as they could show to the audience, you know, how it was, maybe get some feedback, you know, some feedback from the audience saying, well, why was the lighting all like this? Or why did that person jump on that person's head? It didn't make sense to the narrative. Yeah, good point. 
we're not making that clear enough as producers and directors. Can you turn around? Ah, now suddenly that makes sense. Long before opening night, sharing or I don't know what they call it. Let's call it a sharing. Yeah. And um, Zoe Logic was saying, um, Zoe was saying that some, somehow they were talking to somebody at the LSO, London Symphony Orchestra, about um, rehearsals and that they're closed doors. The doors are closed. And of course, I've gate crashed so many rehearsals of the LSO and other people. But yeah, I have often felt like it's getting into Fort Knox. If Jesse Norman was, John, Jesse Norman was in town, ain't nobody going in there except, you know, Jesse and the band. But, you know, I just thought to myself, it's such a bizarre world that everything we do as classical musicians, it's not just working towards one perfection or one of many, like, you know, levels, but all kind of pretty high up there. No sharing. And then on the, on, on the opening night or on the one performance, right, the one performance or two performances, if you're lucky, we suddenly go, hey, audience, come in, see what we've been doing. Come on, come and see what we do. And we'll do it to you for 90 minutes with an interval. 90 minutes, we'll do it to you with some program notes that you can ignore, right? We'll do it to you, um, and then we'll anticipate that you rapturously applaud and, and go away into the night thinking, isn't that brilliant? Now, all of those things might be the case, but, you know, and, and then as, classic, as a classical industry, we wonder why our audiences sometimes are not the size that we hope they're going to be, that we don't have the following that we could have, that we, as an industry, aren't enough engaging with our fans, our followers. And yet, it's very true. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we should get the Zoe Logic Dance Theatre to, to kind of um, dance while during every rehearsal that takes place in this hall, although that would be kind of freakly fascinating. I, I just mean, it, it's chalk and cheese, isn't it? One's contemporary dance, the other could be contemporary music. Right? And, and yet they do things in such totally different ways. We can't fail. We're not allowed to fail. As students, as students here at this university, you're not allowed to. You get criticised for it. You can't fail. You can't play out of tune. I'm not sure what the answer is, Anthony. I can see the expression on your face. You know, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think that the answer is not continued perfectionism. All that's going to end up with is more and more sterile, lifeless, fake. You know, it's you know, it's going to. It's like I don't know. It's it's just not. But how do we fail? How do we fail as an industry in a good way? You know, fail forwards. There's got to be some ways. These course corrections. I mean, I guess, back to the conducting example of Eroica. I mean, or anything, like a big Bruckner symphony. I have, and I teach my students how to, you know, you take something like that where a slow movement of Bruckner 8 is pushing half an hour. I mean, how on earth do you conceive of that in your head as a performer before you're about to perform it, let alone the rest of Bruckner 8 that's 80, 85 minutes. How do you, and, and that's not even if you're doing it from memory, you know, you may have a score there. How do you conceive of that hulking great monster of uh, terrain, you know, that contour? How do the contours work? Well, there are techniques and tools to do that. Uh, and I, I, I teach them to my students because, you know, what I teach is not all about this. It's a lot about that. But, but you've got to have an idea of the map before you set your first foot. Otherwise, you're just going to be riffing for half an hour. Mm. And there's nothing worse in a performance of Bruckner than some idiot conductor who's just kind of going, oh, I think I'll go a bit faster here. I've never done this before in rehearsal, but what happens if I go faster? Oh, that's great. Isn't it? Oh, no, no. Whoa, whoa. Nobody wants that. But yet we need to be free at the same time. And we need to kind of, I mean, how do we combine all this with the, um, the, the ability to fail? It's fascinating. Hmm. 
It's a kind of almost a rhetorical question, but I think it's something that our industry needs to start answering pretty urgently. Yes. Going back to um, strategizing your career, and, um, and you mentioned Ilya Muzin as well earlier yeah. on. In the context of your career, was studying with Muzin a strategic play? Absolutely. It was. 100%. Yeah, because I did what I said a while ago when you asked the question about, you know, following your own path. I, I, I was not kind of, as I just alluded to in that Bruckner example, just kind of going riffing and kind of going, oh, let's just see where I end up. I, I was really quite strategic. I mean, given the fact that this was, you know, back then was pre-internet days, um, I, everybody had heard of Muzin at the time. Everyone who was a conductor had heard of Muzin. Everyone flocked to him like, you know, like moths to the flame. He was like a beacon. Now, I was living in, I mean, I, mean, I studied in London uh, for my undergraduate degree. And then I went back to my home, which was in rural Yorkshire. And uh, I felt kind of wonderfully isolated up there but it was quite difficult to find out what on earth was going on and I didn't stay there too long before I started getting itchy feet and thought look I need to I want to be a conductor I, do, I mean I love it up here but I don't you know and I started you know sending those letters to America and just casting the net I was trying to find out anything about anybody and trying to find out what was what I can't quite remember where that information first came from I think I started I think I went to some I audited some masterclasses at the Royal Academy or something like that. Moosin was over for a week. When it was Colin Metters running the Academy course, he welcomed him as a guest. But I think I knew about uh, Moosin before then. I went to Canford a couple of times with George Hurst and other students were saying, oh yeah, I heard about this Russian guy, Moosin, he's in St. Petersburg, la da la. And I thought about going to Petersburg to study with him, didn't do it. Um, but then I found out that he was studying in, teaching in Siena, so I, I just made a beeline for him and I, I, I went out there. Um, and I think I've always been strategic about this. I, I mean, I've learned... I mean, I started... I, I wrote to Charles McCarris, um because a friend of mine who works for EMI um, just who'd who basically been a recording engineer for EMI on some Macera sessions, said, why do you write to Charles Macera? I hear he actually reads letters and replies to them. And I thought, right, I'm going to write to him. So I wrote to him. I think his address was in the ISM journal or something. That wouldn't happen these days. And I wrote to him, and he replied. And I went round to see Charles. I was so lucky. I mean, I, the number of times I got thrown out by his wife. You know, I'd go around for an hour, an hour. So she'd greet me, and she said, would I say some tea, Robin? I said, yeah, I'd love some tea. Said, an hour this week. Charles, an hour. Five hours later, I was getting almost physically evicted. <laughs> Bless them both. And God rest him. He's, he was such an inspiration. And, and we would just, just talk through anything and everything. He looked at some of my videos. He ripped my tempi to shreds. We talked through Beethoven. When the new Beethoven editions came out, the John Del Mar uh, editions, we talked through those. And we went through. And he says, look, this is very fascinating, isn't it? I said, well, yeah. And I went round there enough to learn. It was all free, of course. In fact, it cost them because it was their time and their tea. Um, I went to some of the rehearsals. I, 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 uh, yeah, I alluded earlier on that I, I gate crashed a load of London rehearsals. I think somebody, I think I didn't get into uh, one particular music college and I, I wrote a letter saying, why didn't I get in? Give me some feedback. Not a, why didn't I get in? Maybe I should have done that. Why, do, just, why didn't I get in? Can you just give me some feedback? And I got some blah, and it was like, I suggest you do this. Send a, send a, send a letter to, uh, you know, to orchestras asking them to, you haven't got enough experience. We could sense you didn't have enough experience. Okay, how do, how do you get experience without go to other people's rehearsals? Go to, and not, you know, um, the Lytham St. Anne's, amateur philharmonic but I mean nothing against Lytham if you're watching um, but I sent I sent letters out to the Philharmonia to the RPO to the um, to the LSO and I remember I went down I was still living in Yorkshire and I went down on the train 
stayed overnight in London, and I went to about three back-to-back rehearsals. And the first one I went to was a dress rehearsal with Maris Janssens and uh, Itzhak Perlman doing the Tchaikovsky. And uh, I thought I was in heaven. I sat there and I felt like I was, uh, you know, the queen. I sat there thinking, my gosh, they're actually... I've never been to a proper rehearsal before. This is the Philharmonia, Philharmonia Orchestra with Maris Janssens. So that was a while ago. But since, and then I moved back down to London, and I, I just went to rehearsals almost daily. Loads of them. I'd find interesting repertoire with interesting conductors and write to the orchestra and say, hey, can I come in? And they send me the schedule. Or they'd say, no, these are closed. It's Jesse Norman. <laughs> well, there's quite a few Jesse Normans I tried to get into. No, you were not going to get in there. Um, but I went to loads of them. I'd go in with my score. I'd scribble stuff in. And, and so I'd, I was always surprised by a number of, well, two key things. One, why am I on my own in here? Oh, look, there's Mark Wigglesworth over there. He's the first other human being I've seen sitting in this otherwise empty auditorium for all four days of this amazing maestro's rehearsals. Why am I alone? Where, where are all the students from the academy and from, you know, King's London? and all, Where are they? From Oxbridge. Why aren't they coming down to this? Um, and the second thing I, 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 I realised was how much you could learn as long as you could hear Janssen's with his back to you with his rather thick accent. My Bruckner four score is just covered in, I can't use it because it's covered in Janssen's. I have to use another Bruckner four score because I went to three and a half, four days of, of Bruckner rehearsals with, with, with Janssen's. Every, every few minutes there was like a, 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 a gemstone being dropped. And he would rehearse better than almost any human being has been on the planet. And I just would write it all down. I felt like shouting out sometimes, just stop a second, I just want to write that. <laughs> and I just learned, and I just learned, and I learned, and I thought, why is no one else doing this? Why is no one else doing this? Down in, and, and I just kind of, and I went to talk to them sometimes. Boy, I had to overcome a mountain of uh, inertia against it. Get on the tube, Robin. You're not worthy to go backstage and talk to Maris Janssens. Get on the tube. But I sometimes, I did. I surmounted that, um, and I did. I went back there, and I kind of went, hello, Mr. Janssens. Mm. And, uh, but sometimes I would actually come out with some intelligent, wise, and probing questions. You know, why did you choose this? Why are these all up bows in the second movement? And why, you know, and he would go, ah, yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you noticed this. It's very important. Well, you know, my one, I still still hold on to this little one. Um, it was an absolute gem, if you pardon. Pava Yervin, somebody else who I know well, I just sought him out. Uh, and I applied for his master classes in, um, in Perinu, in Estonia. He's just been doing some more now this, this, this last month. And I went out there and uh, I just was like a sponge. This wasn't that long ago. You know, it was, just, what, 15 years ago. I was by no means a 21-year-old conductor then. I was eager to learn and to be ripped to shreds. And, uh, and so I kind of followed Parvo. I assisted him quite a few times. It was very, I get on like a house on fire. I think a lot of people get on like a house on fire with Parvo. And I assisted him in Bremen. I assisted him in uh, London, some of his Nielsen. Um, I think one, I, I, I can't remember when it was. I think it was one of the Nielsens he was doing with the Philharmonia. He had Victoria Mulova uh, playing the Beethoven. And Victoria Mulova, was as she has been for the last 15 or so years, playing in a very kind of like hybrid, historically informed way with, I think, gut strings, but a modern bow and, uh, and all the rest of it. And um, I went to her, and I, because I'd met her in the dressing rooms backstage, and this was in one of the rehearsals. And I went to her and I said, you do something really funny here in bar 400 and... Uh, and, uh, and I'm so proud of this to this day, Anthony. She said to me, you know you're the first person who's ever noticed that. Because I, I think it goes up an octave in the original and she stayed down or the other way around. Um, something weird, but it, was, it wasn't just willful. It wasn't, she wasn't improvising. It was something, I guess, in the manuscript or in conflicting sources. I don't know what the, the reason was, but I'm so... This, well, I still wear my medal that I spotted something. Parvo wasn't, didn't, he didn't spot that. Or maybe he did, maybe he didn't care about it. Or it wasn't interesting to him. I don't know. He had bigger fish to fry. But um, yeah, you know, and uh, I, just, I still don't know how and what. Design it yourself. 
design just, you know, if you're a conductor, you so much need to see other conductors work. You so much need to see other, and you, yeah, there's something called YouTube, but, you know, really, if you really want to watch great conductors rehearse on YouTube, Carlos Kleiber, although don't rehearse like him, because no one can except him, and, and Maris Janssens. Go and watch Maris Janssens rehearse. There's got to be tons of it all over YouTube. But go to rehearsals. I don't understand why they don't. Well, I'd, I'd like to just sort of round it off with a, with a final uh, question. I wish we could talk all day. How many of those questions have you actually asked? <laughs> How many, have you got about 40 questions there and, and I've answered about three? Is that uh, right? It's better to have more than you need. I yeah, you need. I just... I, no, it's Let's see if I can answer this in one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> sure. That'll be impossible. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the American conductor. I'll probably pronounce his name wrong. John Morsery. Uh, oh, um, um, Macheri. I Macheri, think. sorry. I think I may be pronouncing it wrong. Um, John Macheri. He says something that's, that intrigued me quite a bit. Now, let, just let me quickly quote it to you. Um, he says, um, and I quote, The person who stands before a symphony orchestra is charged with something both impossible and improbable. The impossible part is herding a hundred musicians to agree on something, and the improbable part is that one does it by waving one's hands in the air. Close quote. As a conductor, is this something you resonate with, or do you have anything to say about this quote? Well, I certainly can't answer that one <laughs> in, in one sentence. I, I, I may well... Before you mention that to me, I, I've not come across that quote, but although it certainly is a fascinating one. And I don't know much about John Malcheri's career, although I seem to recall that he was quite renowned for uh, music on the lighter side of things, which is in no way intended to sound like a disparagement at all. I could be totally wrong. Um, but that was very parenthetical. It's not got any bearing on his wisdom or the validity of that. If I can just unpick that yes. for, for a bit. I mean, I think broadly, I definitely agree with that. I think most conductors would. But it kind of doesn't necessarily cover everything. It, it sounds great. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really lovely quote because mm -hmm. it does sum up an enormous amount of what we do as conductors. I think if I was going to be picky yes. or pick it apart, I think one of the things I might pick holes in is that you, you said it's something like along the lines of it bend, you bend a, a, a hundred people to your will. Is that quite what he? I don't want to misquote him. Um, charge uh, the impossible part is herding a hundred musicians to agree on something. Ah, yeah, that's slightly different, isn't it? Because it's not to your will. Uh, to yeah, I see, in a way, I don't think that's one of the hardest parts of being a conductor. Because in a way, you don't really have to get them to agree on it. You just have to get them to agree at significant points. And then, for want of a better word, and this is going to sound rude, it's not meant to, to just kind of tread water or drift at the other points. Like, like water just following the, 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 the path of least resistance. Um, I mean, I guess at a very basic level, uh, your chosen tempo as a conductor is a pretty significant choice, or plural, choices throughout a piece or a symphony or whatever. Um, and But you're going to end up, if you have 100 players, let's say, you're going to end up with more people who disagree with you about, say, tempo. And it's often tempo that they will disagree about. You're going to have more people that disagree about tempo than agree. You're going to have more... And the vast majority of those people who disagree aren't going to say anything. They aren't going to make your life difficult. They aren't going to sit there and strop or catcall from you know the back of the orchestra. They'll just kind of either grudgingly accept it or often, and I don't mean to be unkind to great musicians, almost unwittingly accept it. You know, on some kind of sub subconscious level going, this is fast, this is too fast, but I've got more important things to think about right now. And then they'll finish and they'll go, oh, another conductor who's some speed merchant or whatever. Um, I, mean, I mean, there is, even today, and I think it's right that this is the case, there is a hierarchy in professional orchestras. And the vast majority of 
orchestral rank and filers won't suddenly start sticking their head above the parapet and go, are you doing this in two or four? Or won't start saying, is that really how slow you're going from the ninth desk of the violas? It's not, it would be through the section principal or through the leader. Um, and that's correct. Otherwise, it just becomes a shouting match. Although I was in a conducting competition in Italy and, um, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> thankfully not so much when I was conducting, but when I saw some of my colleagues in the competition, it did turn into a bit of a uh, vociferous Italian argument about various things. So, but anyway, that's maybe a different language in more senses than one. Um, but yes, I mean, a leader, a concertmaster, will often put me right about a tempo. This is unplayable at this speed, or this is, or whatever, or is that how fast you're going to go? Is that how, because we need to know, because if that is it, then I need to change the bowing, or whatever, boom, boom, boom. And great leaders will be blunt and black and white within, you know, uh, wearing more than a cloak of respect and mutual understanding, I'd like to think. Um, and great leaders are worth their weight in gold then they, they really are because the great leader is wow make or break so i mean it's the most important human being on the platform bar none more important than me more important than any soloist because they can function without a conductor they can't function without a good concert master and a good concert master is part artist part shop steward and uh they're, they're some of the greatest musicians on earth and I've had the privilege to work with some of them. And I've learned more about conducting and mu making music from the person who sits in that, that chair than, um, than the conducting teachers, often. But I, so I don't think it's a, them to agree. They may disagree. But, they, but I mean, professionals, I mean, amateurs and youth orchestras too, but professionals are there to do a job. And they, yeah, the worst thing that they can do is to start visibly and audibly disagreeing. Um, I think, so they can't. Uh, I mean, they can make they can make a case for can we please change this or this doesn't work like this, and I think my way of making music is to at least entertain all of those uh, possibilities within reason, keeping an eye on time. Um, if it becomes too much of a democracy, then a you run out of time. B you end up with some kind of lowest common denominator, uh, sprawling mess of an interpretation that just doesn't have anyone's stamp on it. And it, you know, that's not why people come to concerts or buy recordings. Um, I think, I think a, a better way of putting it might be that one of the conductor's greatest strengths and surprisingly important surprising skills if you can see it is to get a hundred people to agree how amazing something is that's a perhaps a better way of putting it whether it's a new piece because you've got to be as a conductor you have got to be an ambassador you've got to be an ambassador for the whole history of music to the audience and for whatever's in front of you to the orchestra you've got to be an ambassador for it and it doesn't matter if, 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 I don't know, Lauren on the 19th stand of bassoons really can't stand Shostakovich. Because when you're conducting Shostakovich, it's got to be, he, Shostakovich has got to be not just the greatest composer ever, but the only composer ever. And if you as a conductor can make 10 people, let alone 110 people, all agree that right at this moment, this music is the only piece of music ever conceived. And composed then you're doing something right and it is possible to do that it is possible to do that you and it goes back to what you and I were talking about a while ago about emotional investment in what you're performing and what you're working on um, I think and I think that's something that's really intoxicating when you can get a hundred people to agree on that and even what's more significant almost than that is the people who grudgingly come to that point of view and who, I don't know, share with you, oh, this piece of James Macmillan, you know, when we started rehearsing it four days ago, I hated it. Why did you bring that piece to us? And now, after the first performance, I can't get enough of it. It's not just an amazing piece of music, but you as a conductor have taken us to a place with that, that I, I just thought, you know, et cetera. 
I don't know, I chose James McMillan because I've had that experience with various of his pieces, and they're often quite difficult in many senses of the word. I'm just incredible composer. Um, things like uh, Isabel Gaudi or um, Trist or something, both of which I've had big experiences with orchestras who have, you could just feel the, it's like moving the Steinway to begin with. You give your first, and within seconds and within bars, I mean, I'm not just talking with amateurs, I'm talking about with pros as well. You can just feel this resistance of them kind of going, mm. not necessarily with Jimmy McMillan, but certain pieces of music or another Chike Five. Mm. You know, if you can get people to agree that your Chike 5 might actually have some validity, then yes, you've certainly won them over. What was the other bit? With your arms. Yes. Yeah, well, you see, th this is just, this is, it's, it's fake. This is, it's just, it's, I mean, you can't play the violin without your arms. And you can't play the piano without your arms, but you can certainly conduct without your arms. Worst case scenario. And, and I realise that John Malcheri is not just saying your arms. I mean, just with your arms, your f eyebrows, your eyes, your facial expression, um, your chin line, whatever. There's a lot of tools in the conductor's toolbox. But it's, it doesn't really matter what it is. It, it's, again, to do with that energy. It's back to the Tai Chi thing of this kind of, you know, you create some kind of flowing, you know, some glowing orb of, 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 of energy and you basically pass, around, pass it around. That sounds like I'm just making up some specious bunkum hoity to some nonsense. But it isn't. It's true. It happens. I, I've, I've witnessed the most extraordinary things happening on stage in rehearsal and performance, where I, c I can remember it happening in Reed, I, d I don't know, in Marla and in Shostakovich and in things, and Elgar, where I have known, that, I mean, I have given uh, the world's most inept upbeat or turned a corner that, you know, even a tram wouldn't be able to f follow. And yet it's been so together, it's been so together I would just look at somebody like Furtwängler, which sometimes was not just artistically some of the greatest performances known to us humans, but was also very together sometimes, even though, you know, his conducting wouldn't probably pass physically, technically wouldn't pass my conducting module here at the University of Southampton. There's a, it's to do with energy. Having said all that, Anthony, there is a clear technical uh, skill set that if you want to make it easier and quicker and shorter and more pain-free for the orchestral musicians, you learn that technical skill set. You learn your tick, uh, tricks and tips. You learn your shapes. You learn your gestures. You learn your patterns and all the rest of it. There's quite a lot to learn. It's not just waving your arms around. There's a lot of finesse to it. There's a lot of skill. And it's basically, it's a time saver, apart from anything else. You get your message across far quicker. One of Muzin's great things when I was studying with him and what other people were saying about him was his story was that he was suddenly plunged into the opera pit at the, I, I don't know, I assume the Mariinsky in Petersburg and as a young man. And he had to take over, I don't know, two, three, four operas or ballets, probably operas, with no rehearsal taking over somebody else's preparation. And how else can he show not just let's stay together here, folks, but how else can he show, and here's what I want to do with this, and it goes to there, and then now is the right time for that. How else can he show that except with his hands? And that's why he said, you learn to do it with your hands. And I talk far too much. I mean, in this podcast, even here I'm talking far too much, you know, I have many, many weaknesses as a conductor. One of them is talking too much. Huh. Nobody listening to this will be surprised. But what I should be doing is showing it all with my hands. And I think sometimes I'm quite good at that. I'm not like music. But um, it, 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 <sighs> there are limits, though. Because conductors can paint all sorts of amazing gestures and they can get all sorts of incredible things across. Yet, for example, one of the things that makes a Carlos Kleiber performance unlike anything else in orchestral 
history, to my mind, is because of the way he thought and perceived music as a, as a human and the way he expressed it when he was rehearsing and when he was performing. Now, one of many questions you haven't asked that you could easily have done is, who's your favorite conductor? Or who is the greatest conductor of all time? Now, if you'd asked that question, I would have had no hesitation in answering Carlos Kleiber because, you know, there are many great conductors, alive or not alive. But, and then there's Carlos Kleiber. And then there's Carlos Kleiber, who kind of breathed a different air from the rest of us. He really did. He, uh, as, as the great Maris Janssen said, he was like a you know, bird floating above all of us. And if anyone's seen Carlos Kleiber rehearsing, there's lots and lots and lots of it. He would, a, 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 an old, um, actually it's, it's that guy who's a recording engineer for EMI, um, told me a story about one of his sessions with the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, and, and, and he was talking to one of the players in the Vienna Philharmonic uh, about um, Carlos Kleiber. And this was a long time ago when Kleiber was still alive and when he was occasionally making recordings, um, perhaps not with the Vienna Philharmonic then, saying that, you know, and this guy said to him, so, so how, do you, how do you like working with Carlos? And the guy said, oh, well, he's Carlos Kleiber. And, and, and this Vienna Philharmonic fiddle player said, um, you know, whenever Carlos comes to town, which is not very often, he always books, he always asks for about, you know, six days of rehearsal. Uh, even for things quite standard like a pair of Brahms symphonies, a Brahms two and a Brahms four. He'll ask for four days, five days of rehearsal. And because he's Carlos Kleiber, he asks for it. And because he's Carlos Kleiber, he gets it. And we all think, before Carlos comes, we're the Vienna Philharmonic, we are not going to let Carlos need to use all of that time this time. We've just done Brahms two with blah. We did Brahms four with Carlos only four years ago. We're not going to net, he's going to cancel one of them. And we all think that with the Vienna Philharmonic for him's sake. And we all sit there and it's good Morgan, blah, blah, blah. Carlos is in town. And we all have this gung ho attitude that, you know, we'll be done by lunchtime. And as it is, we get to lunchtime three hours later. Carlos is on bar four, and we are like puppies, puppies in his hand, hands. And he can do anything he likes with us. And so it goes on for days, and then we, boom. Now that story pretty much sums it all up, because they're, they're quite rare, the conductors that really genuinely know how to use time that well and have enough to say. But if you watch rehearsals of Carlos Kleiber, you don't just see a master at work in terms of uh, shaping things. You see, well, you see somebody who, it's like when you zoom in using a microscope, it's like Carlos was able to zoom in, you know, 10, 100 times more than us mere mortals. And yet at the same time, he was able to, zoom out 10, 100 times more than us mere mortals. So he would often work at such incredible detail, leaving, as he was renowned for, the, the Kleibergrams around on people's music stands with little tiny drawings of, you know, uh, notes saying, um, um, Lieber Hermann, nur ein bisschen Pütz forzando, am Auftakt zum um, 400 and, you know, just boom, just a little um, uh, Liebe Grüße, Carlos you know, please would you play this a bit more sports and on little messages in stands when he ran out of time right? he would still leave these things he was like a, so just everything was refined to the nth degree and, and you hear things, you know, it's not just a matter of a sports ando, it's how much sports ando, how much peak is there, what is the shape of the delay, do the clarinets delay at the same rate as the horns do, do the, is there slightly more second bassoon in the blend of the chord, is the second bassoon maybe dis, uh, uh, diminuendoing slightly slower to just give a little stronger root as the chord changes colour, you know, the, and, and if it's changing colour, is it changing from purple to red, or what kind of purple has it come from? So you think like that, because he thinks like that. 
And he thinks like that because he's got such a brain or had such a brain. He, if you see his rehearsals, it, he is able to strike comparisons and metaphors and stories with this needs to sound, it's not like this needs to sound a bit more like the sunrise. Horn solo in the finale of Brahms 1. Okay, yeah. No, it's nothing like that. It's, you know, the, I mean, just finding uh, cross-references in the way musicians, professional musicians, think they want to sit there and go, just tell us if it's faster or slower. Tell us if you're going into four or into two and let us have an early break and job's good. That's what musicians think they want, but they don't want that on the whole. Some will, most don't. Most musicians want to be inspired. And Cliver would inspire them to make some connection between the colour of that, 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 that roof of that building they can see through the window and the shape of this chord because he could see it in the first place and he could combine that visual with that oral. And then he had the skill to get it out. Now that's before you start talking about anything to do with his hands. Remember, he was married to, for years and years and years, a dancer. So he had, and of course he was the son of one of the greatest conductors who ever lived on the planet, Erich Kleiber, yeah, who was a pretty fine conductor. So he, and so he was able technically, but also spontaneously, able to create this really rarefied combination of technical precision and excellence, mechanical uh, certainty with uh, alchemy of, of, of spontaneity, of improvisation, movement improvisation. So it looked like he was both incredibly technically assured, and yet he looked like someone who was making it up on the spur of the moment and was literally being the music. And that's all in rehearsal. Then you get to a performance and he then, he kind of trusts that everything he's done for the preceding, you know, 70 hours is bedded in and he trusts them, and he can then start... It's almost like he's saying, right, everybody, we've all done our hard work, now the fun begins. Let's see what's going to happen now. And he does then almost max out that amazing combination of precision and alchemy. And that's why his performances and his recordings are, to my mind, untouched. I mean, whether it's those famous Beethoven 7 and 4 with the Concertgebouw, or that Rosenkavalier. I, I don't know if you ever heard it or seen it. You know, the presentation of the rose in uh, Kleiber's uh, first Rosenkavalier performance. I, I, I have chills going up my spine as I think about that. Nothing comes close to that. And I, I, I mean, because, because he was able to do things that few other people could. Um, I've lost touch with, with this podcast, let alone John Malcheri's uh, comment, but um, yeah. So, Kleiber, yeah. I think my point was that Kleiber could get that extra few point, per percentage points out of a performance and out of an orchestra because he did talk. I mean, if ever there was somebody who could show it with his hands, it was Kleiber but he wanted to make people understand and he wanted to make people know what. You know, what, what color white, what shade, how does the shadow work and what analogy can I inject into everybody's brains right now to get them to be on the same page as I am and to make everybody go, what? Okay. And he... He, few, I think few musicians have that kind of imagination, that imagination that kind of stretches so far. And yeah, so he did have to verbalise. But I think that was his secret source, partly. Because he wasn't just saying, let's go faster, let's go louder, more sunrise. He was talking like that, 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 that we mortals can only dream of. Robin, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure.